All right, hello everyone. Um, we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Linda Gerhardt. I'm sort of pinch hitting as a presenter for this webinar because the original presenter had some uh, issues she had to deal with today, but um, I'm really happy to be here. I am the Senior Community Engagement Manager for Mighty Cause, um, and I was able to pinch hit because I actually handle all of our social media promotion and digital marketing for Mighty Cause, the company who's proud to host Georgia Gives on Giving Tuesday this year. Um, so I'm really happy to ex discuss this topic with you. Um, and just to let you know, I have Deanna Anna from the Georgia Gives team um, also on the webinar. She's going to be joining me for a Q&A session. And we have Bonnie as well, who's going to be around to help you with any technical issues that you might have um, hearing or seeing the webinar. So if you do have any technical questions um, that you need some assistance with, you can just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel. Um, so here's a quick look at everything we'll be going over today. Um, it's a small list, but it's quite a lot of content. So we're going to try to keep things moving at a brisk pace brisk pace. Um, and just as a housekeeping note, we're going to be doing the question and answer ses session at the end of the presentation, just so we can plow through all the great content we've got planned for you. Um, so if you do have a question that you want to ask while I'm presenting, just go ahead and type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel. And when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll make sure to make time for everybody's questions. Um, so before we dive into the nitty gritty of social media on Georgia Gives and, and on Giving Tuesday, I wanted to pass the mic to Deanna for a minute just so she can um, talk shop with you about Georgia Gives. Hi, everybody. This is um, Deanna Anderson. I am um, new to the Georgia Gives team. I'm serving as a marketing consultant right now and will be part of the marketing team as we gear up for Georgia Gives. I um, just wanted to remind you guys that georgiagives.org is up and running. Um, and one of the great things about having um, my um, calls here with us today is um, hopefully you all know that that is a new platform for us and you've received our communications that it's really a five step, easy step to get your new profile up um, and running and that we are here for support for that. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you need any help getting up on um, the new Mighty Cause platform. Along with that, the toolkit, which um, those of you who have participated with us in the past is up and running and will be continued to be updated as we go through um, from now until December 3rd when we kick off um, the campaign. It's a great place for resources as you're planning, um, including you know templates and upcoming webinars and events, really kind of your go-to source for information. Um, so make sure you check that out. And again, um, if you have any questions about getting your new profile up and running on Mighty Cost, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to um, us. And then as we go through now until um, actually December 3rd, Again, we'll be updating that nonprofit um, toolkit. We will be sending out emails. Um, make sure you have joined our Facebook group um, because we put a lot of information there as well. And just know that we're here for a re as a resource for anything that you guys need to have your most successful Georgia Gives on Giving Tuesday yet. All right. Um, so I'll take the mic again. Um, so you may have come to this webinar um, for social media tips, and we're going to be getting into some nitty gritty platform tips. Um, but first, I wanted to talk um, about social media workflow at your nonprofit. Um, so again, you may have wondering, maybe wondering why uh, you're, we're not getting straight into how to target a Facebook ad. Um, but beyond all of that little stuff that can help you perform better on social media, all those little tips and tricks, um, is your internal workflow. And that's really at the center of your success as a nonprofit. A nonprofit that uses social media successfully is coordinated internally. And you can usually tell how coordinated a nonprofit is just by looking at their social media. Uh, so having a strong workflow will help you be more efficient. Um, since with most nonprofits and most fundraising campaigns, there are lots of moving parts and anywhere you can streamline and maximize your efficiency is really 
important. Um, you can also keep your staff and volunteers from duplicating efforts or having too many people working on the same thing so that you can keep your messaging laser focused and consistent across all of your social media channels. Um, so you can also work on reducing errors that can easily happen on social media on a busy fundraising day like Georgia gives and reduce gaffes like two staff members posting on social media at the same time, which has happened to me at nonprofits that I've worked for um, or posting conflicting information. Um, so how social media workflow has worked for me in the past, and I wanted to share this with you, um, is appointing a social media manager for the giving day. Um, so obviously if you have someone who normally manages your, your social media or someone who even literally has that title of social media manager, it's a really obvious choice. But if like a lot of nonprofits, you have several people working on your social media accounts or just kind of flitting in and out to post about certain parts of your work, it's really important to appoint one person to be the captain of the ship. Um, even if it's just for the duration of the campaign and it's not a permanent position, um, your social media manager will coordinate posts, make sure that your social media plan is integrated with your overall communications plan for the day so that everything that you're saying on social media lines up with what you're saying in emails and anywhere else you're going to be promoting your Georgia Gives campaign. Um, so they make sure that everything is on track, that you're going through all of your talking points and you're sticking to your key messages and that you're on track and running a consistent, cohesive campaign for Georgia Gives on social media. And you'll also want to identify your team. Um, so for a lot of nonprofits, especially ones that are smaller, um, that may be one or two people, but it can also include volunteers who might help with everything from writing copy to taking photos or even putting together a video. So uh, when you're putting together your team, don't leave volunteers out of the equation because they can be a huge help to nonprofits on social media, especially on a day like Georgia Gives where you're doing a lot to raise a lot of money um, and you need all the hands that you can get on deck. And then once you've got your social media manager and your team, um, you and your team will want to get together and create a social media plan, which will include things like where you're posting, how often you're posting, um, your key messaging and talking points, um, key pieces of content you want to share, and also coordinating any paid advertising efforts and coming up with a proposed budget for ads or boosted posts. Um, when it comes to this sort of planning, I really don't recommend getting too lost in the weeds of thinking about making spreadsheets with what time you're going to post and getting stuck on what time of day is the best date, what time of day is the best time to post. Um, I think it's really important to focus on the big picture, your high level goals and strategy for the day, and just make sure that your team is all on the same page so that, you know, the person who's handling scheduling Facebook posts can worry about actually building out the post and your team can just come together and make sure that your cohesive plan is coming together on social media across all of your channels. Um, one thing I highly recommend as well when you're in this planning phase and getting your workflow together um, is sketching out an editing process um, because social media is generally just more informal than something like an email or a letter, but you still want to put your best foot forward and make sure that all of your posts are copy edited, um, that you have your links checked and everything's working, that images are displaying properly and so on. So I recommend having two pairs of eyes on each piece of content that's going out and that, also, that includes tweets, that includes Facebook posts. So um, I would wanna ask you to get an editing process in place so that you have, a, you have it solid by the time you get to December 3rd. And then I also recommend meeting regularly with your team so that you can all brainstorm ideas, talk through any issues that pop up, and basically get in sync and get working together and get ready for Georgia Gives. All right, so now I wanna talk more about social media planning. I promise we're gonna to get to the actual tips, um, but first I wanted to go through um, some of the planning steps since that's the phase that you all should be in at this point in the campaign. The first step of social media planning, and this is really just rolled into your general campaign planning, is finding your angle for promoting your nonprofit on Georgia Gives on Giving Tuesday. Um, while general pleas for help can work just fine, it's best to have a focus, like a specific program or initiative, or even just a thematic focus on one thing, and then coming up with a marketing hook around that focus. Um, your hook is basically your elevator pitch. 
Why should people care? What sets your nonprofit apart? What's the story with your nonprofit? What story are you telling? Do you have a, a tagline or a theme? Um, and one good example of a uh, good marketing hook for a giving day is Lost Dog and Cat Rescue Foundation's Giving Tuesday campaign, um, which was a general appeal. They weren't promoting any specific program or initiative, um, but they did have a, a really great hook and tagline. Um, their campaign, which you can see screenshotted here on this slide, was all about saying yes. Um, they get a lot of requests for help, for you know, assisting animals that you know need assistance that need help that they are asked to, to take in and for Giving Tuesday they had asked their followers to enable them to say yes to helping more animals um, and that really resonated with their supporters because ultimately people support a rescue like lost dog and cat because they care about animals and they want to see as many animals get as much help as they possibly can. Um, and the proof is really in the pudding here. They raised over $47,000 and they had an initial goal of $30,000. And this is a smaller volunteer run animal rescue. They don't have paid staff or professional social media people on their team. This is all volunteer run. So this really gives you a good idea of what a smaller nonprofit can do with just a really focused, well done, effective social media campaign and campaign hook. The next step of planning is identifying your needs. Um, so think thing, through the things you'll need to do well on social media. And one thing you're definitely going to need is images. So figure out what your needs are based on your campaign's marketing hook and then figure out how to make that happen. Um, so that might entail a photo shoot with a volunteer photographer, but it can also just mean collecting images that you already have into one place. Um, and one tip here I have is asking staff. Um, I worked at an animal shelter here in Alexandria Virginia and they were a photo gold mine they had tons of pictures and videos of the animals in the shelter on their phones and they were a huge help when it was time to plan a campaign all I had to do was say hey guys send me all of your videos and all of your pictures that you have stored on your phone and I had tons to work with um, you'll also want to talk want to consider video um, which we're going to talk about more later on because video is a, an extremely effective tool on social media so think about whether you'll want a really slick professional looking video with some production values or again just pull together videos you have sitting on people's smartphones and work with those um, both can be equally effective and you can also elevate and slice together the random smartphone videos you have um, into something more cohesive with some free editing tools there's some apps you can download um, you can use the youtube editor which is free um, kazoa is another program that's free to use um, and again just don't be afraid to ask for volunteer help here because you may have you know youtubers in your volunteer base or people with video editing experience um, that you won't know about unless you ask. Um, something to think about as well as any testimonials or quotes you'll want for your campaign, which is important if you're going to be focusing on the personal effect your work has on people that you serve or you help. Um, these things can take a little time to coordinate since you'll need to do outreach. So think about these needs now and come up with a plan to get what you need from people. Um, in fact, I'd honestly start having those conversations with anyone you want for a quote, a testimonial, a photo, a video. Now this is a really great time because they can just take a really long time to put together and you'll have to wrap that stuff in together and package it into content so getting an early start here is definitely helpful um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about graphic design needs later um, but just think about what um, your graphic design needs are and once again I'm sorry to sound like a broken record but if you're small you can absolutely feel free to ask volunteers you may have some people with some graphic design experience um, in your volunteer base who are happy to help you out and then the last step is really just putting all of the different things we just talked about into motion. Um, so start scheduling posts. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about scheduling in the next few slides, but basically scheduling your key content ahead of time will help you tie your social media efforts into your other efforts like email so you have a cohesive presence and plan for Georgia Gifts. Um, draft your posts with scheduling tools and edit them. Um, you should be testing links to make sure that they work, looking at images to make sure 
sure that they display how you want and copy editing, edit, copy editing to make sure that no embarrassing typos get posted. Um, again, I recommend having two pairs of eyes on each post so that you can double check yourself and nothing falls through the cracks. Because there's no worse feeling than on a high stakes day like Georgia gives, looking at your social media posts and going, oh gosh, my tweet went out with a typo and I can't edit it. Um, so yeah, that's the last step. That's kind of a simple, simple process that you can go through is to sort of figure out your workflow for putting a, a social media campaign together for Georgia Gives. And now we're going to move on to the actual platforms themselves and go through some social media best practices. So the biggest thing I can recommend to nonprofits on a day like Georgia Gives is to go where your audience is. Um, that'll be different for every nonprofit based on where your supporters are and what kind of work you do, but spend the most time focusing on platforms where your audience is actually pay paying attention. Um, take a look at where you have the most followers so you can make sure your efforts are not wasted. Um, you don't need to devote equal time to all platforms, especially if your Twitter following outpaces your Instagram following by thousands of people. Um, and as an off offshoot of that, Georgia Gives is really not the best time to experiment with new platforms that you're not really comfortable with. Um, there are a bunch of things you can try, but Georgia Gives on Giving Tuesday is high stakes and your time is limited on the day of. So if you've never used Snapchat, you don't need to use Snapchat on Georgia Gives or waste your time trying to figure out how to fit Pinterest into your campaign if you don't have a presence there most of the year and it doesn't really make sense for you. It's totally okay. And in fact, it's recommended that you stay in your comfort zone um, on a day like Georgia Gives instead of putting a lot of effort into platforms where it's really not going to pay off. Um, but if you do want to start cultivating an audience on some new platforms um, or build more of a following, um, now is the time to start doing that. So that come November and December, when you really need them to come through, you've spent six months or so cultivating an audience there and getting engagement and building a presence. So now is the time to start posting on Instagram if you're not really an Instagram user and you want to get started doing that for Georgia Gives. Another best practice, again, sounding like a broken record, is to utilize volunteers, especially if you're small, you have a shoestring budget, or you have limited resources. Volunteers can be an absolute godsend. And sometimes nonprofits limit volunteers to certain roles or are worried about giving them access on social media. But there are a lot of people who work in marketing and manage online communities for a living and have great skills to offer you. I volunteer for some nonprofits in my community because I work in digital marketing in my everyday life. Um, so it doesn't make sense for me to wash dishes when I have these other skills that I'm happy to lend to them. So just make sure you ask. If you need something, ask. Um, so whether it's on social media, via email, through your volunteer portal, or however you do it, if you need help with something and you don't have the internal resources to do it, ask for volunteer help. Um, so this is a big one. This is one best practice that I recommend utilizing for social media year round, and that is scheduling. Um, pretty much all platforms have a way for you to schedule and a free tool that you can use to do that as well. Um, use Facebook's publishing tools, which everyone with a Facebook page has access to. And for Twitter, um, use TweetDeck. Um, TweetDeck is a free Twitter product that all Twitter users have access to. Um, programs like Buffer and Hootsuite, which are paid programs, can also be a great help, especially with Instagram, which we'll talk a little more about later. Um, scheduling ahead of time will help you integrate your social media with your larger promotional plan, and you can optimize your posts to win golden tickets and power hours and prizes that might be hourly. Those are not announced yet, so it's kind of hard to put those pieces into place, but you'll have some specific times most likely on the day that um, you, you want to post content so that you have the ability to win a prize. So these tools are available. I recommend making use of them as you're gearing up for Georgia Gives um, and save your live posting on the day of for anything that necessitates that. For instance, if you want a prize or hit a milestone or something like that, everything else in my book should be scheduled ahead of time. 
And lastly, we recommend using hashtags on Georgia Gives. Um, the name of Giving Tuesday itself is a hashtag, and you've got Georgia Gives happening on Giving Tuesday again. So I just wanted to briefly talk about hashtag, how hashtags work and how to utilize them for Georgia Gives. Um, just because you have a couple of different hashtags you're going to be working with here, there are some campaign-specific hashtags that will be announced at a later time by the Georgia Gives team. So I just want to make sure that everybody who's on this webinar is comfortable with hashtags and understands how they work and how to use them. Um, basically, the hashtag is just a pound sign that makes any word you type after the hashtag searchable, which connects your posts to other posts that are using the same hashtags. Um, they really rose to prominence on Twitter, but now they are used pretty much on all social media platforms. Um, so Giving Tuesday is a hashtag. Um, that's really just the name of the event itself. And I always get lots of questions about this around Giving Tuesday, but it is hashtag Giving Tuesday run together because when you enter a space in a hashtag, the hashtag stops. So if you were to post something with hashtag giving space Tuesday, you've basically just made giving your hashtag and Tuesday was not included. So you're not going to be getting the right searchability that you want. And people who are also participating in the Giving Tuesday hashtag are not going to be able to find you or see your post. Um, this hashtag, um, Giving Tuesday, the event name applies to the overall global effort, not specifically um, Georgia Gives on Giving Tuesday. Um, or any specific platform or Giving Tuesday event. So when you want to specify that you're participating in Georgia Gives, you want to use the event hashtag, which is hashtag, hashtag GA Gives. Um, so you'll want to use both of these hashtags on your posts, but I, if you have to choose for whatever reason, if you have a character limit you're bumping up against, um, you probably want to make use of the Georgia Gives hashtag because it's more specific if you have to choose between Giving Tuesday and Georgia Gives, but these are both ones that you are encouraged to use during Georgia Gives. Um, so again, there's just some more um, specific hashtags that you'll probably also need to use on the day itself, and those will be announced at a later time. Um, but if you have any questions about using hashtags, um, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit more about some hashtag etiquette later on, um, especially on some specific platforms. But you can always let the Georgia Gives team know that you're a little bit confused, or just reach out to us at Mighty Cause. We're happy to help you out, and most of our people are well-versed in social media, so don't be afraid to ask questions. All right, so now we're going to move into the type of content that works on social media. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but these are specific types of content you'll want to have ready for Georgia Gifts. Um, you don't necessarily need to do all of these things, but if you did, in fact, do all of these things, we can pretty much guarantee you that your social media posts are going to be more lively, get more clicks, and get more can't get more uh, engagement on social media and your campaign's branding will be stronger. Um, first, as we talked about earlier, you're going to need some stories. Um, that includes testimonials, quotes, permission to tell those stories if they belong to other people, and it can also just be a general campaign focus and story that you're telling about your nonprofit. Um, a general story can work, but even within a campaign that's about a larger program, it's helpful if you're able to, um, to have real stories of real people that have been helped by your work or examples of how your work and your programs and services look in action. Um, and that helps build a, an emotional connection with followers and inspires them to donate. You'll need images, and in many cases, this is just gathering everything in one place, as I mentioned. Um, you'll want to think about video because while it's not a requirement, it does really well on social media and can really help your nonprofit be seen on social media. And video is also just a piece of content that inspires people to donate because it's a multi-sensory experience for the person who's watching it. So it gets people's brains engaged and gets them involved in a way that a bunch of text really can't. Um, think about other graphics you might need, like a logo that's specific to Georgia Gives, um, an infographic, and even just things like Facebook cover photos and Twitter banners and avatars that have some Georgia Gives branding to them. And finally, you'll want to think about copy, which is the stuff that pulls all of these elements together. 
Um, so I want to talk for a minute about the storytelling aspect of content because it's really important and kind of dictates whether or not your content is successful on social media. Um, at the heart of it is whether or not your story is successful and gets people involved. Um, the first thing you've got to do is find a story and then find smaller stories that fit within that. I really recommend crowdsourcing this when you can um, because sometimes um, people around you can remember things that you didn't. So ask staff, ask volunteers, ask other people who are involved with your work. Um, and sometimes people are just in a better position to see these stories in action. Um, so, you know, ask your staff, ask people who work in your centers and work with the public. And one thing that you can do is sort of use that as a litmus, litmus test. If somebody comes to you with a story and then two other people come to you with that story, you can feel pretty confident that that is a good story. Um, one thing I've also done before is just browse through my photo files and see what I've got. And if there are any images or videos I already have that stir up an emotion or a memory in me that I could potentially use to tell the story on social media. Um, you'll also want to make sure that you're tying these stories into your overall goals and your focus for the, your Georgia Gives campaign. So, you know, even if you have a really great story that works, if it doesn't really fit in with what you're trying to do and the larger story that you're trying to tell about your work on Georgia Gives, it may not be the right fit. Um, and lastly, another thing to consider here is access and finding the right subjects. Um, first of all, if you don't have access to the subject of a story, you can't get permission to tell their story, then you cannot tell that story because you need their permission in order to tell their story. Um, so again, this is a great time to start contacting people. Um, and you'll also want to think about whether the subject is right for what you want to do. Um, you want a subject that's relatable, sympathetic, and translates well to images and video and quotes and however you plan on packaging the story. So even if you have a really great story, if it involves someone that hates attention, hides from the camera, and is sort of standoffish, then maybe it's not really the best story to tell, and you maybe want to look for one that may, may not be as great as a story, but has a more sympathetic subject who's more comfortable having their story told in this way. So moving on to images, here's what you'll want to keep in mind. First, work with what you've got. If you only have smartphones to work with, make that work. Um, smartphones are actually really powerful little tools that can take excellent photos and video. So don't think that you need to have Ansel Adams taking museum quality photographs um, for your social media campaign. You don't. Sometimes candid photos or ones that were snapped off the cuff can be the most impactful ones. Um, but if you do want to set up something more formal, like a photo shoot, see if you have any photographers to help you with the images, um, whether they can help photograph whatever you want or edit those images. And best practices for social media are to use faces whenever possible. The human brain is wired to seek out faces. On, so on most platforms, a face gets people to stop and scroll. And if you post an image of a face with eye contact, the odds of them stopping to look at your photo are even better. Um, you also want bright, clear colors and bumping up the contrast a bit on your photos can also help. Um, just use that with caution. You don't want to go bananas and have photos that are so high contrast they look strange or grainy. Um, next, I wanted to spend some time talking about video, um, especially since a lot of you indicated that this was an area of interest for you in the survey. Um, and it's a really important tool on a giving day like Georgia Gives, because as I mentioned, it's, you know, it builds emotional connections with people. So this is really the kind of content that's worth investing some time and effort into. Um, first, if you have access to a videographer or professional equipment, or editing, that is awesome, but you don't really need any of these things to make an excellent video. Um, your iPhone takes amazing video that's high resolution, and as a bonus, you can often even edit the video on your phone with some apps, um, add music and effects and text overlays, and even YouTube has a free editor that you can use. So, you know, there's lots of options if you don't have a huge budget for a video. Um, if you're willing to put a little bit of budget behind it, Animoto is a really easy video editing program. Plans are cheap. Um, they're as cheap as $8 a month. And you can also, again, ask for volunteer help, speak, help because, again, you may have a YouTuber in your midst who's really great at editing videos and has all of the tools you need, but you've been asking them to wash dishes or take out trash. So really don't feel like you need to be Spielberg. You don't need to make an awesome for winning picture here. A campaign video can be simple and low budget and be just as effective. 
Um, videos you want to keep pretty short. Um, all of the platforms also prefer that you upload your video directly into their platform, which is called native video. Um, and unfortunately, um, sharing YouTube videos, like links to YouTube can actually end up doing more harm than good, but you definitely still wanna upload them there, but you'll most likely just need to have the actual video file on hand so you can upload it to social media. Um, so here are my tips for creating effective videos. Um, one, write a script and have other people work on it with you or at least give you feedback. It's really hard to make a cohesive, coherent video without some kind of script. Um, that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to write out every little line, but at least having a plan for how you um, wanna tell the story and get from point A to point B in your video is recommended. And you wanna just make sure that you're telling one story at a time. Um, nonprofits, because they're so passionate about what they do often have so much they want to say so they end up sticking a million different points and things in the video and it just makes it confusing to watch um, so I really recommend trying to focus in on one story one point that you're making and you can also create a storyboard which doesn't have to be beautiful or even shown to anyone else um, just to plot out the video and this is especially helpful if you're shooting new footage of your video rather than splicing together content you already have um, keep it short um, as we mentioned in the previous slide ideally three to five minutes um, sometimes less um, and you should format it for social media and keep in mind that a lot of people are watching videos posted on social media from their phones now so the rule of thumb has changed it used to be that you wanted to turn your phone around and shoot things landscape but now you actually want to keep it vertical and Instagram will actually want a square video for you so you may need to actually have several cuts of your video that's formatted for each social media platform um, you can use photo montages if you don't have film footage, and that can still be an effective tool. Um, you can do that with most editors, so don't be afraid if you need to pad out a video that's really short um, or you want to add to it, you can use still photographs. And you also want to have feedback from people, as I mentioned, so that you don't have a big glaring mistake there that you don't notice because you've been editing this video for weeks. So have other people take a look at it and get some feedback on it. Um, and now I wanted to share with you a really great example of a fundraising video that you should watch if you need some inspiration or you're just, you know, you're looking to see what makes a great fundraising video. It's from the Humane Society of the United States from 2013, which is a year that I actually worked there. Um, so I was not involved with making this video because they actually have their own video department. Um, but this was the biggest fundraising video the organization had ever done. Um, it's called Meet Billy, um, Rescued from a Puppy Mill, and it's the story of a staffer named Adam who rescued a little long-haired chihuahua named Billy from a puppy mill. Um, you can easily find the video and uh, just Google HSUS Billy, and it's the first thing that will pop up. Um, it's a short video, but it just does all of the right things. You've got this one story that tells a larger story about puppy mills and the organization's work to combat them. You've got not one, but two sympathetic subjects the first being Adam, who is a handsome guy, very sympathetic and looks directly into the camera and talks to the viewer. And you've also got Billy, who's an adorable little dog with his tongue hanging out and he's just super cute and uh, you immediately want to hug him. Um, so now you probably don't have the budget um, dedicated to this kind of project uh, or a whole video department the way the HSUS did. But what I'm asking here is that you pay attention to the style and the pacing and how they present the story because they did everything everything right. And let me tell you, as somebody who worked there at the time, that was a real red letter year for the organization because of that video. People were so invested in this story and this dog. Um, so definitely, if you're looking for some inspiration, look up the Billy video and give it a watch and use it to inspire you as you build your video. All right, so moving on from video, here's some information about other graphics you may wanna create. Um, you may wanna create a cool Georgia Gives specific logo or just simply add the date of Georgia Gives to your logo. These are easy changes you can make that go a long way. Um, you may find it helpful to create some infographics, um, information about your impact, your nonprofit's needs, specific programs, or even breaking down a specific issue that you tackle can be a really great fundraising and storytelling tool. Um, one thing to also think about is what you'll need on the day of. Um, so having an image in the back of your 
in, in your back pocket to announce that you won a prize or you know to celebrate reaching your first thousand dollars is really helpful um, and for these type of graphics i love canva it's a free program and they also have a program for nonprofits to use it and get access to some expanded features for free and it can be really awesome for these kinds of uh, additional graphics they also have templates for things like facebook cover photos and youtube banners um, twitter banners and it's super easy to use and effective i know photoshop and xd and other editing programs um, but i still use canva for a lot of purposes as in my role as a marketer because it's just so easy to use and very quick to make a, a slick professional looking graphic especially for social media and finally we're going to talk about copy and what kind of copy works for a day like georgia gives um, first you'll want to draft things and have at least two people review it this does not mean that you need to do it in a word document you can plug them into your uh, scheduling tools and have people review it there so that it makes sense in the context of that platform um, you'll want to keep your copy easy to read accessible and approachable and that means keeping it um, clear, direct, and avoiding the use of jargon and inside baseball terminology that probably does not make sense to people outside of your nonprofit or your field of work. Um, emojis are totally okay to use with social media, um, but just be careful and judicious with them um, and make sure that you know what they mean since a lot of them can have double meanings. And you don't want, and you also want your copy to be skimmable since you're not writing the next great American novel, you're writing a social media post. So break up that text and try to avoid giant walls of text. All right, and so now we're gonna move into some specific tips for um, platforms on social media platforms. On this webinar, I'm really sticking to the big three, which are Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, because if we discussed every platform in depth, we'd be here all day. And frankly, these are the platforms nonprofits use most prolifically, since there aren't many um, nonprofits using something like Mastodon. Um, we're gonna stick with the big three and we're gonna start out with Facebook. Um, so Facebook had a golden age where it was basically like free democratized marketing for nonprofits back from like 2010 to 2014 and or so, but it's changed a lot since then. And now it's actually got some specific challenges for nonprofits. Um, first is the problem of decreased reach on Facebook, which is something nonprofits and companies have been noticing for a few years now and has really only gotten worse. Um, in 2017, Facebook made some significant changes to their algorithm that prioritized family members and friends and people's feeds, and they made even more challenge changes in 2018 that made conversation and interaction an important factor in whether or not Facebook decides to put a post in a user's feed. Um, so that's a really great feature for users, but it, it does have some consequences for nonprofits that are using Facebook pages to connect with supporters. Um, they also have some new advertising rules, which are basically a result of what happened during the 2016 election. So their advertising guidelines have gotten more strict, and you'll find that if you skate the edge of these rules, your boosted post or ad might get flagged a lot more easily. Um, so this may not be a huge uh, challenge for an animal shelter or a food bank, but for nonprofits who do work that's more political, um, it can be a huge barrier to getting your ads through the review process. Um, as a result of Cambridge Analytics, Politica and the election, users are also a little bit more wary of Facebook and filtering to other platforms um, and cautious about things like making donation and clicking links on Facebook. Um, also, this is a big one. Um, Facebook rolled out their own fundraising tools, which compete with tools like Mighty Cause, and they market those pretty aggressively. So you've all probably noticed if you post something on Facebook with the words nonprofit or charity or donate in it, you might see a prompt to start a fundraiser. Um, they also market pretty heavily to users having birthdays, asking them to fundraise for charity, um, and all's fair in love and war, but it does cause some confusion when your nonprofit has chosen another platform for your fundraising or you're participating in a day like Georgia Gives that is hosted on a specific platform. Um, so we've seen it cause a little bit of confusion for nonprofits and donors. So the good news is that there's workarounds for nearly every challenge we discussed. Um, the first tip is to post algorithm friendly content. Um, it's worth noting that no one really knows for sure how Facebook's algorithm works because it's changing, it's mutable, and um, to some degree it's unique to each user based on what they interact with and how they behave on Facebook. But there are some things we know perform a little better on Facebook. 
Um, Facebook Live is a great way to be seen because of all of your followers. Um, all of your followers who have not turned off those notifications for Facebook Live will actually get a notification letting them know that you're live, um, which will prompt them to view your video. Um, Facebook is focusing a little bit less on stories these days, but they're still a great way to be seen on Facebook. They've also added a new feature called Watch Party. Um, it's actually not that new. I think it came out in 2018, where you can invite people to come watch a video with you. It can be your video or somebody else's video. Um, it would be a great way to launch your campaign video um, and it's really great for expanding your reach because the idea is the pe that people will bring other people in and tag their friends um, so you can get more people watching the video and, and absorbing your content. Um, some old standbys like native video, meaning video files that have been uploaded directly into Facebook and images continue to do well. Um, and some marketers are noting that long text posts, which were once a complete taboo and something you should never really do, are seeing better engagement and better results, um, largely because people need to click the read more button to keep reading, which means that people interact with it. So that can be something you can experiment with um, leading up to Georgia Gives just to see if it helps your post reach and engagement. Um, but I recommend breaking up the text if possible because um, Facebook actually allows you to use bullet points and lists now. So might as well break up that content and make it easier to read. Um, tip two is to boost posts, target them well, and plan ahead. Um, so obviously Facebook is a for-profit company and they like when you give them money. Um, not only does an ad or a boost help your post reach more people, it also means you're usually rewarded with reach for subsequent posts when you spend money. So that is something magical that happens when you give Facebook money. Um, so come up with a budget and it really doesn't need to be much. It can be a boost of like 10 or $20 for a key post on on Georgia Gives, but consider asking the powers that be at your nonprofit for a little bit of advertise, advertising money to play with. Um, now, I've had people report to me that they boosted posts, that they didn't see results, or they got clicks from people who were across the country, and the reason for that is that they were not targeting properly. Um, if you don't give Facebook information about who you want to see your ad or boosted post, it'll just kind of haphazardly blast it out, um, and that's not really an effective use of your money. So play around with Facebook's targeting tools and make sure that you have, uh, if you have money to spend on an ad, it's being seen by the right people. Um, if you do your work locally, you can restrict your ad to a geographic location. And if you're not sure, you can just boost it to your followers, which is a pretty safe move. Um, I recommend giving yourself a little extra time to set these up because, um, as I mentioned before, you may notice that the review process is a little bit trickier and your post may get flagged, so you may have to uh, put it through again. Uh, tip three is to use Facebook if you have a lot of followers there. Um, there's been a lot of press and a lot of buzz among marketing communities that Facebook is dead, but the data really does not bear that out. Um, people are still on Facebook, people are still checking their news feeds, and while there's still there's been a little bit of a drop in users, it's still got millions more active users per day than any other platform. 1.15 billion people still log on to Facebook every day. And just to put that in perspective, that is more than every single person in the United States. So Facebook is far from dead. Um, there's some data on this slide, but the one thing I think is most interesting is that Facebook's most active users, um, which are women 35 and above, are also generally the nonprofit sector's um, most engaged demographic with online fundraising. Um, so it's a great resource for nonprofits. So um, don't feel like you have to leave Facebook. Facebook is not dead. Um, tip three is to avoid the donate button. And we talked about this a bit earlier, um, but again, the donate button uh, forces people to donate using Facebook's fundraising tools. And those donations do not count for Georgia Gives because Georgia Gives is hosted on Mighty Cause. Um, so, if you are asked to add the button, and you'll see this when you're setting up uh, advert ads and boosted posts, don't put the donate button on there. Use uh, learn more. Um, and if you are missing any donations on your report on Mighty Cause, or you have a donor saying, hey, my, don my donation wasn't counted on your page, that's most likely what happened. Um, and what you can also do is ask to see their receipt, and that'll sort of give them some idea. You'll give you an idea of where their donation may have processed. All right, so our last tip for Facebook is to make use of some of the new tools they have available for pages. Um, it used to be that you could just post images and videos and words, but um, that it was more, now that was, you now have more options. Um, and 
Facebook often rewards you for using the new op options they offer you. Um, one thing you can try is polls, which you can insert GIFs into now. Um, they're interactive by nature and can help boost your reach because people have to interact with the poll. Um, we've already talked about the power of watch parties. Um, they have more options. They've pared it down a bit recently. They used to have a lot more, but Facebook just really likes it when you use the new tools that it provides and new things that they roll out. So something silly like adding that you're feeling excited on your post can actually help it be seen by more people. It's not a magic wand, but it's one thing that can help. Um, and obviously one thing to be aware of, to be cautious of, is the support nonprofit button, since that is the button that will compel people to donate through Facebook instead of your Georgia Gives page. All right, so now we're gonna move into some tips for Twitter. Um, so Twitter is also a platform that's been getting some media attention lately, and it's one that more and more nonprofits are using really well. Um, the benefits of Twitter are that it's all about interaction and conversation, whereas uh, uh, platforms like Facebook and Instagram are more about talking to an audience. Twitter is about talking with them. Um, one cool change that's not new, but is nevertheless still very exciting, is that they've done away with their 140 character limit. You now have 280, um, and links and images don't count towards your limit anymore. So it's a lot easier to say what you want to say without having to do like verbal gymnastics around that character limit. Um, it's always super busy on a day like Giving Tuesday, and that's um, part of how it can help you expand your reach online. Um, we already mentioned this in an earlier slide, but my first tip is making use of TweetDeck. It's a free Twitter product um, that allows you to do quite a bit from scheduling tweets, monitoring your mentions, um, and monitoring any hashtags that are of interest to you so that you can get in on the conversation. It's at tweetdeck.twitter.com, and you just use your Twitter login credentials to sign in. Um, it's a really great tool, and on Georgia Gives, your social media manager can just have TweetDeck open so that you don't miss any of the action on Twitter. Um, also, so TweetDeck now has a composer, which you can use to add things like GIFs and polls to your posts. And really, this is the easiest way to monitor the multiple hashtags you'll be looking at on Giving Tuesday and Georgia Gives. So you can set TweetDeck up to monitor those hashtags. So you'll see anytime somebody uses those hashtags, you'll just see a running feed of it. On that note, the next tip for Twitter is making smart use of hashtags. Um, you'll want to use the Georgia Gives and Giving Tuesday hashtags, but you can also use other hashtags related to your work, like hashtag wildlife, hashtag stop hunger, um, and so on to help your tweets be found by others interested in work like yours. Um, pay attention to any trending hashtags and participate in them with the caveat that you should read the threads to understand what the hashtag is all about before jumping in, because we've all heard horror stories about companies jumping into trending hashtags that are about something serious and trying to use them to sell hamburgers. Um, so don't be that nonprofit that goes viral for all the wrong reasons. Just a quick scan should give you an idea of whether or not a trending hashtag is appropriate for your nonprofit. And you can see what's trending when you log into Twitter. They're right on the side of your home screen. Um, posts with hashtags get around 60% more engagement than those without on Twitter. So if Twitter is part of your social media strategy, it is in your best interest to utilize hashtags. Um, and just like Facebook, um, on Facebook, certain types of content um, does better. Face Twitter um, will help you stand out on in people's feeds if you diversify the con type of content that you share. Um, you can post images, use videos, and go live, which will result in notifications to your followers. One little thing that can help is using emojis in posts. Um, again, just be sure of using them carefully and understanding the emoji before using it. Uh, for instance, the peach emoji might seem like a really great idea if you're a food bank and just as a bit of Georgia pride, but Obviously, it's got a dual meaning, one being an actual peach and the other one being a butt. So if you aren't sure, check um, the meaning of the hashtag before tweeting. Emojipedia.org um, is a great resource if you're not quite sure what a, uh, an emoji means, but they do actually help with engagement on Twitter. Um, one little last tip for Twitter is that you can find shortened URLs for Twitter right on Mighty Cause. So just um, go to the page you want to share, your Georgia Gives page, um, and click the Twitter icon um, on that sticky nav, and then um, copy the link or post from there if you have your Twitter account connected. Um, but this eliminates the, the need to go through something like Bitly to shorten your links. And next up is Instagram. 
Um, so Instagram is an image-based social media platform. And while I love Instagram and it's really awesome for things like sharing outfit pics and pictures of my cat, it's a platform that a lot of nonprofits have really struggled to figure out how to use because it's got some specific challenges. Um, the biggest challenge is that you can't post live links in your posts and users also can't copy and paste them from posts. So that's a little bit of a wrinkle when you're trying to get people somewhere specific. And you also can't easily schedule posts like you can on Facebook and Twitter, um, which can make managing Instagram a little bit tougher. And there's no desktop API that you can use to post on. Um, you can basically view and reply and like posts on Instagram, but everything else is done in app, which means you have to have the app on your phone, your personal phone, along with any images or videos you want to share, which for some people is a little too close to comfort for um, them. Um, it's too close to your personal Instagram because nobody wants to be the person who accidentally posts a selfie to your nonprofits page. Um, so these things can make Instagram a little bit more challenging for nonprofits. And there's also a little bit of a generation gap. Um, there are people on Instagram who are not millennials, but it is kind of a millennial um, social media platform. Um, Facebook users tend to skew a little bit on the older side and Instagram tends to skew a little bit younger. So a lot of nonprofits have expressed to me that they question whether it's the right place for them to find donors. But the good news is that Instagram has plenty of benefits for nonprofits. Um, number one, it's growing really fast as a platform and has 1 billion active users every month. That's quite a lot. Um, so people are using Instagram more and more, and there are more opportunities to be seen and connect the public. Um, and since Instagram is owned by Facebook, a lot of the tools you want, especially advertising tools, are available through Facebook, meaning you can set up an Instagram ad through Facebook's API using their targeting tools and your saved audiences. Um, and that's also a way to get around not being able to include live links and posts on Instagram, because when you're paying for an ad, you can post a link. Um, and it's also made for visual storytelling. So it's a place where you can really draw people in and build emotional connections with images and video. And lastly, that coveted millennial audience is using Instagram and they're getting older and wielding more spending power each year. So even though they're also on Facebook and Twitter, you can really cultivate the next generation of donors through Instagram. So the first tip I have for Instagram is to convert your account from a user account into a business account. And the reason you should do this is because business accounts get features that users don't. Um, those include contact buttons and Instagram insights. Um, you can also connect your Instagram business account to your Facebook business account, um, which will help you with advertising. Um, to convert your profile, you must have a public profile and you just sign up for a business account, convert your existing account and set up your business prof profile. And that involves verifying some information but this is a really great easy win that you can do to utilize Instagram better. The next tip is sticking the link to your Georgia Gives page in your bio. You can't post live links and posts, but you can link them in your bio, which allows users to get to the page that you want them to visit. Um, this does add an extra step for users, but Instagram users are used to this. And if they want to get to a link, putting it in your bio is a lot more effective than putting it in a post because in the app you can't copy and paste a, a URL. So put the link there and in your post and, and in your post just mention that they can visit your page to support you by clicking on the link in your bio. Um, so one of the coolest things about Instagram is stories. Um, Instagram, sto Instagram stories were developed in response to the popularity of chat Snapchat. Sorry, I couldn't say that. And they function similarly. And in fact, Instagram stories were kind of a daylight theft of Snapchat's technology. Um, but that's a story for another time. Um, stories are live on Instagram for 24 hours, and then they disappear unless you add them to your profile as a highlight or you cross post them to your feed. Um, the great thing about them is that they're real time. So Instagram uses an algorithm like Facebook does. So sometimes users will see posts and content a few days after it was posted. But since stories have a limited shelf life, they're a way to be seen when you want to be seen. Um, in the apps, in the app stories are um, 
from, from accounts that people follow are listed right at the top of their feed. So they're super visible and easy to access. And as an added bonus, if you've never posted an Instagram story before or haven't posted one in a while, your followers will get a notification that you posted a story, which is a huge boost. Um, if you do a live story, people will also be notified that you are live. Um, and there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with Instagram stories. Um, you can post text and photos and video, but you can also use filters, um, use boomerang to make short mini videos, which is a cool way to showcase short events like throwing confetti, jumping, and so on. Um, one of my favorites is Super Zoom, um, which zooms in and adds music and effects. And you'll really just have to experiment with Super Zoom to see what it can do. But it's definitely a way to sort of bump up the humor and cute factor of your posts. And you can also do face filters if you have someone from your org talking about a campaign with dog ears you may want to do that if that's your thing. Um, and there's also GIFs and, and stickers and all sorts of fun stuff you can add into your stories. Um, one thing they just rolled out recently was the ability to have people ask you questions, um, which you answer in stories as well. So that's great engagement. And you can also add polls, which again is fantastic engagement. And just as a note, if you have um, 10,000 followers or more, you can add links into stories, um, which users can access by swiping up in the story. That's a really high bar if you're not Chrissy Teigen. Um, but if you have those kinds of followers, you have that option available to you. Uh, my next tip is about finding inspiration for Instagram, because if you do want to figure out how to do well on Instagram, but you're kind of struggling to know quite what to do, it really does help to look at nonprofits who are using the platform really well. Um, look for large nonprofits in your area of interest. Um, like if you're an animal shelter, you may want to look at the ASPCA or the Humane Society of the United States. If you run a food bank, check out what Feeding America is doing and just make note of what kinds of things they're posting, what kind of content they have what hashtags they use, and so on. Um, these larger nonprofits have huge teams of people managing their social media, so you can easily get some ideas for how to use Instagram effectively from the big dogs who are doing it. Um, one nonprofit that always does a really awesome job on Instagram is Charity Water. It's actually kind of annoying how good they are at it, uh, but they're a great charity and they really have been able to harness the power of Instagram well. And you'll also notice that most of their photos feature people more often than not, and they're usually looking directly into the camera and they've also bumped up the contrast of their photos just as a callback to the easier, uh, the earlier slide with some best practices. Um, so hashtags are a big deal on Instagram and Instagram actually lets users follow hashtags, which allows them to put posts with a particular hashtag in their feeds. Um, so it can be a huge boost if you learn to use hashtags well. And since there's no character limit, you can really just dump a lot of them into your posts. Um, we recommend hiding them to keep the posts neat if you're gonna use a ton of hashtags, which you do by adding four or five periods in their own lines at the ends of your end of your posts. You can also use emojis. Um, and you can see an example of how that's done here on the slide. Um, and you can also dump additional hashtags into a comment, which also just keeps them out of the, the main meat of your post and gives you the benefit of having a comment on your post, which is important because Instagram really looks at early engagement on posts in their algorithm. Um, so do some hashtag research to find out what people are using on Instagram. Um, for instance, animal rescues, things like adopt, don't shop, and cats or dogs of Instagram are active hashtags that gets, get used millions of times. And actually when you start typing in a hashtag or tapping it in as it were, Instagram tells you how often that hashtag has been used. Um, so try to use ones that are popular and used often. All right, so we're in the home stretch. I know we're running up on our hour, um, but before we take questions, I really just wanted to quickly go through some other social media platforms you may want to use on Georgia Gives. And the first is Snapchat, and when it comes to Snapchat, it's something that I find um, a lot of nonprofits are really just confused and intimidated by. So before we go any further, ask yourself, whether you use Snapchat like at all in your fundraising. Um, if the answer is no, I'm officially absolving you of any obligation to use Snapchat that you may feel, because as we said earlier, you want to spend the most time and effort where your people are. So if you're really itching to use Snapchat for Georgia Gives, one thing that can be really effective is a Snapchat takeover. Um, now that could work in a few different ways. It could be you taking over somebody else's Snapchat, like a sponsor or community partner, or even a local like 
Snapchat celebrity, or you can invite someone higher profile to take over your Snapchat on Georgia Gives, which means that they can promote it to their followers and you'll get a little bit of extra traffic. Um, so LinkedIn is one that you should definitely use, and it's a social media platform, but the rules are just really different on LinkedIn. Um, to effectively utilize LinkedIn on Georgia Gives, I would recommend having your C-suite staff or your executive director and director level staff leading the charge on LinkedIn, since those are probably the people with the biggest and most active network on LinkedIn. Um, your board of directors should also be posting about Georgia Gives too, so don't forget to ask them, um, because your board members are often like insanely well-connected people. Um, you can also tap any sponsors you have, any partners, to help you get some traction on LinkedIn and talk about their own connection to your nonprofit and your campaign. Um, you can also post on groups on LinkedIn, um, though definitely read the rules of the group before posting and, and sort of ingratiate yourself to the group before you post uh, promotional stuff. Um, and it's a place where content is really important. So having things like blog posts, guest blogs, and so on are really great for generating traction on LinkedIn. Um, you can definitely just post to your Georgia Gives page, but things like guest blogs that other people can promote on LinkedIn as their work or something they're involved in are more helpful. All right, so this is the last platform. Um, Pinterest is the last one. And again, ask yourself the same question about Pinterest that you asked yourself about Snapchat. Do I use this platform and will I ever use it again? Um, if you do want to use Pinterest, I recommend signing up for a business account because it has different terms of service and you'll gain access to Pinterest's educational materials. Um, Pinterest is a virtual pin board and it's almost entirely image based. So choose your best, most arresting images and consider what kind of content does well on Pinterest. That's how to's, instructional images and infographics. And you should also add keywords to your pin in the title, description and file name so that your image is searchable and people can find it. Um, and one last interesting thing to note about Pinterest is that I think it's the only social media platform that um, doesn't have images where people's faces, the images of people's faces do not actually perform better. They perform and repinned, are repinned less often. And lighter images with kind of a wash that slightly makes them look overexposed tend to get pinned more often. So it's just kind of interesting because the rules are a little bit reversed with Pinterest. Um, but those are just some tips if you do want to utilize Pinterest in your Georgia Gifts campaign. All right, so I made it exactly to noon. Um, I did want to open up the floor to questions um, and get Deanna back on in case you have any um, specific questions about Georgia Gives. So if you do have a, a question, um, feel free to grill me about any social media platforms. Just type that into your questions box. And um, I know a lot of you may have to sign off, so feel free to do so, but I'm happy to stick around and answer as many questions as you've got. Um, all right, so the first question is about Instagram. Um, Instagram doesn't have a publishing tool platform, is that correct? Yes, they don't actually have a publishing platform that you can use like uh, Facebook's publishing tools where you can schedule posts. Um, so that's not something that they um, typically, that they just don't have it. You can use, I think, Buffer, um, or is it Hootsuite? I think it's Buffer or Hootsuite that actually can post on Instagram for you if you have that, um, that program in place. One thing you can do um, is save posts as drafts. So basically get everything related to the post together, get the picture in there, get the copy up there and save it as a draft. And then when you're ready to post it, you can pull it up as a draft. Now, one thing to know about this is that it doesn't work across different devices. So if you save the draft of your Instagram post, um, you, you can't pull it up on somebody else's phone. So you have to be the one who publishes it if you save it on Instagram as a draft. But that can be a way around that. That's more, um, makes it a little bit more manage manageable to post on Instagram. Um, the other thing you can do is just get the content together, um, get your text in a, in a note on your phone so you can copy and paste it and then save all the images somewhere on your phone so that you can easily access them. So that posting is really easy. Um, it's unfortunate that you can't do too much to schedule posts. So there are some programs that will just like remind you that you wanted to post something at a particular time. Um, so Instagram is a little bit more challenging in that way because you can't just set, it, set everything up to fire when you want it to. But those are a couple of tips you can try to sort of get that that portion of your social media plan more manageable. 
Okay, um, are iPhone videos acceptable if we don't have a professional? Yes, absolutely. Um, iPhones are actually really great cameras. Um, I have a, a Samsung Galaxy myself and it's a really, um, it has a great camera. It's a fantastic camera. It's not, you know, Spielberg's not gonna use it, but it's a really great camera if you need to take an image. Um, so definitely use an iPhone video and it doesn't need to be the best quality. Um, it really is just all about the content that's in the video. Um, just as a story, um, I have a giving event um, that has, that features um, great apes. And they had a lot of videos that were just, you know, people's iPhone videos. The staff would just catch, a, a, you know, a chimp doing something kind of cool and they would take a video of it and they would splice those videos together and create um, a video that was really fantastic. They would just use the um, an editing app on their phone and they did really well. So. You know, the average person, we're so used to seeing mobile generated content that it doesn't really matter um, if you have a professional video or if it's just something that your staff put together on their iPhones, because um, we're used to seeing both on social media. So the because it's social media, we're used to seeing videos that were built on people's phones. Um, it doesn't matter and you can still make a great video. It really just comes down to the content. Um, if you wanted to do something a little bit fancier, you could try splicing together some iPhone videos um, with some uh, you know still photos and some text overlays and get fancy in that way but it, it really does not need to be as fancy and sometimes nonprofits will shy away from video because they're scared uh, that they're not doing a good enough job but really if you get good content and good shots use whatever device you have at your disposal you don't need a professional videographer if you don't have access to one um, this is a question for Deanna. Um, somebody wants to know when can they expect the Georgia Gives Toolkit? So the toolkit is actually live on georgiagives.org. Um, if you go into, I already have it pulled up, but, um, and it has all of the information um, that you need um, that we have right now. So it has a link to the private Facebook group. It has a link to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It also has a free training on-demand webinar that actually talks about the new platform and how to get started. This is also where we'll update all of the webinars, training opportunities, and events moving forward. And then um, also just a lot of different resources um, to help you get started, make sure you get your page and profile or your profile updated, and then to really you know, plan moving forward. A lot of the same things that we talked about today, we have links um, and and downloads um, to information that'll really help you start to build out your plan. Thank you. Um, and we actually have another question for you, Deanna. Um, how early do I need to start registering on the platform and when do I need to send out my first communication? I'm happy to take, take the second question. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you wanna address registration. So today is when you should start putting <laughs> your profile up. Um, really, the sooner, um, the better. Um, you know, we will have additional trainings over the summer, and then our kickoff event is in September. And, you know, um, the sooner, the better. That way, if you have any challenges, we can help walk you through. It really is five easy steps to get your profile um, updated. So we're encouraging everyone um, to do it as soon as possible. Um, and to really use that as a kickoff to start getting your plan in place. Okay, and so the second question about when to send out your first communication, um, it's really never too early, um, you know, it, when your page is kicked off, I'm not sure, Dana can maybe address when donations open, um, but that is a perfect date to sort of, you wanna start teasing it before they open so people have a heads up, say, hey, we're participating in this, it's really great, we have, we can accept early donations starting on this date, so give people a heads up, announce it when donations open and then just start hitting them, but it's actually not too early to start um, sort of in the background including some Georgia Gives information. So if you send out an e-newsletter or even a paper newsletter, um, you know, including that in your, you know, list of upcoming events, um, that way it's sort of you're jogging people's memory. They know about it. They've seen it. It's familiar. 
Um, it's not too soon to put it on your website. It's not too soon to, you know, put it in the background of things, even if you're not going to be um, promoting it really heavy yet and you're still putting, uh, you know, the pieces in place. Um, but yeah, like it's never too soon to start mentioning it. Um, but in terms of when you want to send out like your first big email and your first big social media post, um, you want to give people a heads up before early donations open and then do a big push when donations open. Um, and you also, I also recommend letting some people who are in your inner circle, um, so big donors, um, folks that you know you can count on to donate to you campaign after campaign, um, getting those seed donations from people and saying, hey, uh, here's a personal email we're participating in Georgia Gives. I would really love it if you could check out our page and um, you know make a donation just to get us started. Um, that kind of personal contact with people who are in your inner circle, um, board of directors is a great great um, you know great place for seed donations um, just to get you started. Um, you can start that you know really when donations open and start letting people know getting it on calendars um, as soon as possible. Um, but I hope that answers the, the question. Um, and this is Deanna. And once your um, page is live, you can actually start taking donations at that point. So once your profile is complete, which is the five steps, um, you are it is open for donations at that point and or pledges. So um, the sooner you get your site up, the better. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the setup is really easy. On Mighty Cause, our support staff is here to help you through the transition to a new platform. So if you need any help, um, technical help, um, or you're just like, I don't know how to get this on there, or I don't know where to find this, um, our support team is available to you. It's support at mightycause.com is the easiest way to reach us because we can actually like send you links and show you how to get to things. Um, but don't feel, be afraid to reach out to our staff because we're here to support you throughout this whole process. Um, so as you're getting things set up, it's five easy steps and I think you'll find it really intuitive, but our support staff is here to help you out. Um, and this looks like the last question we've got. Um, are we able to get a copy of the slides or access the meeting later? Um, so Deanna can also fill in the blanks for me, but um, you'll, be able to find this on the Georgia Gives website once we have a chance to upload the video to YouTube and embed it there. So you will have access to the recording and I'll send uh, Deanna and Bonnie the slides so that they have them and can put them there or send them in an email, whatever you guys want to do. Yes, so they will be um, on the website. Um, they'll be both on G um, Georgia Center for Nonprofits as well as um, Georgia Gives. And then we also will send an email out um, that will give you access to the PowerPoint as well as to a link to where the recording is. And we hope that you share it with anyone who is not able to join us today. And if you have colleagues that had signed up and weren't able to make it, if they registered, they will also get the email with the recording and the PowerPoint as well. Awesome. So I think that's it. I totally went over time. So thank you all for staying on with me a little bit later than intended. Um, and yeah, I think that's all we've got. So thank you to Deanna and for Bonnie for letting me give this webinar. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, and we're really just excited um, as Mighty Cause just to host this, this incredible day. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Bye, guys. Bye.